Hey guys, Kyle here. So, just before the show starts, I wanted to mention our Patreon. You can pay us $1 a month as a thank you, as a tip. You can pay $2 a month to get access to one of our bonus content shows, uh, episodes two days early, and a secret Discord chat where all of our Patreon donors get to go and hang out and talk with us directly. Then there's a $5 tier that you can donate to to get access to a whole bunch more content. Uh, we have multiple bonus episodes on there. So please check it out, patreon.com slash it gets weird. Uh, we don't advertise, we don't make money. So check it out and throw us some money if you think that would be cool. Thanks. Welcome to It Gets Weird, our comedy show where we explore the unusual, the unbelievable, and the unexplained to try and make your world a little weirder. I'm Kyle. And I'm Niall. And we're back in the saddle again. We're back we're gonna in do the a, saddle. Not not to like get ahead of ourselves, but uh, to, we're doing a, a part two to an episode that I didn't record immediately before this one. So I have only a vague recollection of, of everything covered in the last episode. Okay. I, I can I can help you out a bit here, and you know um, I, I I'm excited to you know a little recap will do you good I think um, mm-hmm. in, in the sort of broadest sense I'm not going to get into the details if you want to no I I like I remember things but uh, I like normally we try to batch record two parter like multi parters and it just didn't work out this time it's so. been you know life has been busy um, it's I don't know. been it's been uh, and I don't know. <laughs> Uh, you know, it's, it's not interesting to get into the details, but no. life has been very fucking busy and that just is how it is sometimes. Yeah. Um, and you know, so I, I will say I was a little, a little bummed to find out that I've been fired and I'm contractually, you know, <laughs> finishing up my, my three part episode here, which by yeah, the way, this it, will be three parts. It, um, it's left on, we're figuring, finishing up the dates on your contract. Yeah. We are still open to renewal, but we're far away on money with each other. Um, and, uh, we'll see, we'll see if we can get this set up because I do think you do provide, uh, uh, quite a bit of service to this podcast. Thanks. Um, and I, don't, I, I somehow just have appointed myself the, the boss of this thing, even though this is, this is a co-production baby. Yeah. It, 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 the fact that it is a co-production and the fact that you feel that way did kind of rub me the wrong way when you told me there would be no severance. Yeah. Um, when I was let go, no, I was saying you would have to go through the severance procedure from the show severance, oh. so that you have no memory of doing the podcast because that's oh, okay. the separate Kyle. Okay, see, so no, I haven't seen severance. Oh, okay. Um, is so it's like that's why you didn't white. understand. Okay, okay. Well, it's it's basically like you know work life balance and that your uh, your brain is segmented. So when you're in the job, you don't remember your outside life, and when you're in you're at home. You don't remember your job. That's the oh. premise of that show. Oh, oh God. It's actually a pretty good That's, show. Um, it's, it's fucked up. It's a, it's like in, it's one of those things where like, you always wonder, can they come up with a new dystopia? And I don't know if this has <laughs> never been done before. I'm sure there's some precedent to this, but in terms of like things that I've watched, it's a new type of dystopia. So that idea, um, sent a chill through me with how I've yeah, been feeling it's about fucking my, horrifying. how I've been feeling about my job lately. <laughs> Um, and just <laughs> working in general, um, yeah. because which, you know, full disclosure, one of the reasons our schedule got kind of screwed up is, is because of work stuff. And so I'm like, man, would I delete the two weeks of my memory of like working in, in Arizona for like, that's two weeks of my life that is technically yeah. dedicated to work. Would I delete that? Um, I don't know. Maybe. See if that's a, if that's a question that you that is bringing forth a lot of thoughts in you, then maybe there's a show out there for you. Oh shit! On yeah, Apple TV true. Plus. Well, <laughs> I can tell you one thing, uh, Ed Walters. You know, okay. maybe we could go through if if we regretted this procedure, this this severance uh, procedure, then we could you know maybe uncover it with hypnotic regression. I mean, we've seen it, we've seen it work oh, for yeah so many people. The- the the um, number one true procedure that actually uh, works, you know? Yeah, yeah. Hypnotic so regression. Maybe, maybe it's not lost forever, but um, I, I don't know how that show works. Like, I don't know if they're, like, creating alters and, <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah. MK-altering you or if it's some sort of, like, 
magic or, or maybe they're tearing up parts of your brain uh, physically. I, I don't know. I'm going to guess it's an MK Ultra sort of deal. But uh, seeing as you had last episode that I was on, you had that severance out of your brain. Yes. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you a very brief recap of, of where we're at, where we left off. Um, so Ed Walters, the Walters family living down in Gulf Breeze, Florida. Um, this guy begins seeing UFOs, uh, around his property. Um, and he's had quite a few sightings. Um, I want to say, I don't remember which sighting this is exactly, but I think when we left off, he had had three or four sightings. That sounds right. Um, so. Oh, wait, I don't know anything. I got severance. Uh, right. Yeah. So don't don't act like you know or anything, please. Um, I'll, I'll cover this for you. Um, so, yeah. So he's been seeing UFOs. Uh, he even got sort of like, you know, a blue beam shot down onto him, but it didn't actually seem to have ended up abducting him, maybe. Um, it's also, he, he's also had this like hum that comes in his mind, uh, when the UFOs seem to be near, uh, and he has been submitting photos of this UFO, uh, calling himself Mr. X and saying that he is right. the, he's like the, uh, um, the messenger for this Mr. X who's been at the actual witness to these UFOs. And and importantly, he has not included any of the especially weird stuff that's happened with the UFOs when he's been sending it into the local newspaper. Uh, Namely, you know, the blue beam, there's been this psychic uh, communication with him. uh, And, and he has not included that in these stories. He's just like, I saw a UFO. It was weird. I took photos. Here you go. So all the strange parts have been cut for now. Is it, is it is it that they were that they were there in the story at this time and they were cut or did do you think he added those parts later? Well, if we're taking what he says at face value, it's uh-huh. always been there. He just omits them because he's a, he's worried about the perception uh, that the community will have of him uh, for reporting these extremely strange events. Yeah, um, but is I will say is the do you think that the the public perception is significantly worse for a UFO encounter with like a, a radiating blue beam than it is just a straight up UFO encounter. Cause like, I think he might be misjudging which part of the, his story, the populace would kind of, you know, push against. Maybe, maybe. I, mean, I, I don't know. We do hear this a lot though. A lot of people do. There is that whole thing of UFO, uh, visitor like people who have seen ufos being worried about the impact on their lives their jobs their families if they were to say this in public and give the full details because they will then be mocked so like that that is a thing yeah it's that that's his that's his uh that's his excuse um yeah (laughs) um but he you know there's sometimes where he mentions like you know oh i'm i'm like a known quantity in this community like uh, I don't, I don't want my name necessarily associated with this. Uh, and there's also just the fact that like with the blue beam part of the story comes mm-hmm. some of the psychic communication stuff, which I think is the weirdest thing. Um, plus what we had actually left off on, on the previous episode, episode 370, by the way, if you need to go back and check that out and catch up on what we're talking about. Yeah. If Um, you just listen to 371, then this episode, they will not like, it'll be confusing. It will be confusing. So we'll go from talking about the exorcist, uh, to talking about part two of a UFO story. So don't, don't just, just for this canon purpose, 370 is the predecessor. Yeah. Well, his, his last encounter seemed to be with some sort of being that had come down from the craft. Nice. And it had it had like this like blocky armor on it and big you know it was very the description is very typical of a, a gray alien with the big black eyes and the gray skin and sort of short, um, but this one had like an armor had like this armor almost and like a, a silvery like rod that it carried that it could like em- this like light was emanating from it, um, so. <laughs> 
it, I think that like the more fantastical elements of the story do compound on each other in a way. Yeah. And cause like, it seems to be the same UFO that's visiting him, uh, every time he sees it, mm-hmm. uh, which is interesting. And, um, yeah, it mentally and physically affects him now. Um, so, so is, none of that's made it to the paper yet. Do you think there's any possibility that this alien was just like holding a mag light? It's like just had like a flashlight, you know, it's, like it, it's not some magical or like highly technical. It's just like, you know, or like a nice pen, you know, like yeah. I, it, I don't it, know. It, no, it's, it's entirely possible. I mean, how do we know that these aliens aren't like, you know, outer space cops and they just like misidentify oh, yeah. Yeah, well yeah they, like he's got his mag light he's shining in the window they've misidentified the earth as a vehicle yeah uh, and he and, thinks someone's fucking in it yeah, oh no i was gonna say the earth's speeding you why do you oh. always have to go so blue nile come on well uh, okay but like you gotta you gotta <laughs> realize that you set me up by saying it's a vehicle and the guy the cop is shoot, shoving a mag light into it that is like pure teens fucking in the back of a car in a in a, like a public park like that's what that is. I so mean, you can't be mad at me. You know, I'm you, reasonable. You can, you can go to fucking. I kind of went to, uh, sir. How much have you been? How much have you been drinking when pl- operating this yeah. uh, planet tonight? Uh, and he's shining in the window. He's just there's just it's just total confusion. You know, it's a, it's a yeah. cop situation. The cop is confused as they usually are, and he he's, yeah, as is the standard uh, <laughs> state of existence for cops: scared and confused. So he's he's yeah. This is an inner an an outer space cop who has rolled up and and shown a flashlight in a mag light in on Ed Walters thinking, Oh, this is the guy piloting this, this planet vehicle thing. Yeah. Um, okay. So who knows? Who knows? But the thing doesn't speak to him. Uh, it must've like when, when it shined the light on him, it must've noticed that his eyes weren't like red or anything. I don't mm-hmm. know. I don't know if Ed like said the ABCs backwards in that moment, but it's possible he, he did, did something to, to convince the alien. <laughs> He psychically uh, did, did the reverse <laughs> yeah. alphabet, yeah. Uh, you know, un- yeah. unintentionally. Yeah, and he did the psychic equivalent of walking on a dotted line uh, with his feet straight, you know. Which I think um, is like, what I think that would be is basically completing a, like a hard level Sudoku. Yeah, so, they, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They, yeah, they had him do a Sudoku <laughs> in his mind. And they were like, all right, checks out, sir. Keep operating your planet and drive safe tonight. Thank you. Yeah. And they went off. So uh, that's where we left off. Uh, okay. and you know, he's always capturing photos of these things. Um, which if I remember correctly, we do not have, right? We do. We do we have do? photos. Oh yeah. Okay. Oh my God. Yeah. We have a bunch of photos. Um, admittedly, uh, there's a number of them that I think are sort of contained almost exclusively within one of his books, like an older print of his books. Um, but I think almost all of his photos have been preserved, I think. Oh, okay. Um, and the reason I, and I can tell you with absolute certainty that a number of these photos still exist, um, because the photos are a very big piece of contention with this story, uh, especially later. So, uh, okay. but we probably won't get to that until part three. <laughs> Um, Keep that on the back burner. We're, yeah, that's, that's the tease yeah. for the that, big yes. finale. The big finale is going to be fun. Um, so this particular experience with the alien being whatever this thing was, he he doesn't take that to the press, right? Uh, mm-hmm. but he does bring up in the book that I was reading of his, which by the way I mentioned it in the first episode, but there is a book where you can find a lot of what he. You can find basically his his side of the story. The book is just called The Gulf Breeze Sightings, and it's written by Ed and Francis Walters because uh, you also get Francis, his wife's side of things. Um, and that's where a lot of this information comes from, and he gets detailed. Um, but he brings up another separate sighting that was reported the same morning uh, that he had this experience, and this report had been sent to move on. So he got the report from the MUFON investigator, Robert Reed, and here's what the report says. Just after midnight, early in the morning of the 2nd of December, 1987, Patton Elsie McClellan of Navarre Beach, about 10 miles east of Gulf Breeze, were watching a late movie on television. Through the west-facing picture window, Pat saw a bright light apparently hovering over the water, 
which was around the Santa Rosa Sound, uh, some distance away. He assumed it was a helicopter or aircraft landing light until it started making anomalous movements, for example, bobbing up and down. The couple went out onto the balcony to get a better look. The lighted object now appeared to have a searchlight that was shining down on the water. As they watched, the light seemed to pulsate and move slowly toward them, then, at an estimated distance of about seven miles, it suddenly winked out. Straining his eyes to the west, Pat asked his wife, where'd it go? No more than five seconds had elapsed when, when LC replied, look up. There, approaching slowly from the west and already at an elevation of about 60 degrees, was the dimly lighted silhouette of a circular object, an object to close that it's out an object so close that its outline appeared 20 or more inches in diameter at extended arm's length. Accompanied by a low humming sound, the object continued its steady course and passed directly overhead. The couple were incredulous that this could be the same craft that they had seen so far away only a few seconds before. However, this seemed the only explanation. Both Pat and Elsie had seen news reports of the Gulf Breeze UFO, and these thoughts immediately came to mind. This was obviously not a type of aircraft the McClellans were familiar with. Elsie, fearful for the safety of their young daughter, rushed inside. Any concern Pat might have felt was quickly overridden by curiosity, and he hurried around to the other side of the house to watch the object as it proceeded toward the southeast. After continuing on this same course for several seconds, the craft veered right and took up a southerly heading. As it moved out over the Gulf of Mexico, its bright lights came back on again and it rapidly accelerated out of the sight. The McClellans were mystified. Neither could figure out what they had seen. About five to ten minutes later, Pat, who had resumed watching TV, saw two more lights coming up the sound. He immediately went out on the deck to investigate. This time it was obviously two aircraft, apparently jet fighters, following the same path as the object had traveled. These jets even made the same right-hand turn and proceeded out over the Gulf on the identical trajectory the UFO had taken. The McClellans had lived at this address since September, and never before had any aircraft flown over their house in this way. So, okay. another thing that I mentioned in the first episode, but, like, there's quite a few military bases in this area. Um, mm -hmm. Which is always, I have now, like, whenever I read stories of big UFO encounters and sightings, I now go and see what's the nearest, uh, like military outpost. Um, yeah, because like, to, I think I think a couple things. Like, uh, first of all, you and I are both are kind of in. If you track the course of the podcast, we're in our most like cynical skeptic era in terms of like this all being some sort of government like disinformation thing like we're in the post disinformation era of, of how I'm looking at all of this shit when we're talking about it so immediately it's just like okay if UFO sightings are always are like so heavily seen around the places that you, that uh, army bases are I don't think that's because that aliens are uh, coming to surveil army bases I think that's because this is probably some sort of aircraft that is being flown in and out of that base that we're not supposed to know about yeah and you know and and, and the thing is, like, I, I get what you mean by cynical, but, like, I, I, I do want to say that, like, I, I've come around from being, like, I, you know, all, all, all UFO cases are completely dismissible bullshit. You know, I, I, mm -hmm. I've come around from that to being, like, honestly, lots of people see things, definitely. Uh, I just have an explanation that I think is more reasonable than, than alien, than, than extraterrestrial visitation. That's really what it comes down to now. And yeah. there's so much shady shit involved with the, we don't have to go over it again, but like it's, it's now much, it now just appears much more likely to me that, uh, people are seeing things and it's like anything that doesn't have like an immediate and obvious explanation is probably related to the military in some way. So yeah, that's, that's where I'm at. Um, but yeah, it, it's, <laughs> I, I don't want because like I, I think that this is like uh, when you when you look at the like types of people into UFOs and stuff, mm -hmm. it's like there is like a type. There are multiple types of guys, you know, um, yeah. and and we have certainly become, I think, a type of guy. But uh, I, I don't think that, you know, I, I, I don't know. I guess I wouldn't use the word cynical. Um, That's fair. 
I, I like to think that it's the most rational explanation for a phenomenon that like I have over time become convinced is, is happening, you know? Um, yeah. So yeah. Anyways, I, sorry. I don't, I don't no, want to I seem like I was like coming, t- coming down on you there, but I, I, no, I, I like, I think we agree. I just used yeah. the wrong word for it. Um, I think we definitely it, agree. <laughs> there's a strange, like I, I just occasionally am hit with like where I would, how I would have, processed an an episode we're recording if we did it yeah. at the beginning of the podcast versus now and i like i i would be handling this information entirely differently and much more just like oh yeah oh my god aliens and it's like now i've seen too much i've well I've, we've come across and, too much and i do think too like this is maybe embarrassing for me to admit but like back in the early days i would like find one article that was like that looks like about 45 minutes of material and i would just like <laughs> you know, base my notes off of that one article. And now it's like, I find a bunch of sources from all over yeah. the place, uh, when I can, uh, and, and this, this one, and, and, and to be real with you, this episode in particular and the first part are all, uh, from Ed Walters perspective and occasionally stuff Francis said. Um, mm-hmm. I, I kind of liked the idea of, giving you Ed's account because it's so long and detailed and has so much that happens. Uh, and then the sort of other things that happened around Ed and the other people that came uh, around Ed uh, who who were, you know, investigating or trying to understand this case. Because uh, mm-hmm. it's, I don't know, it's more interesting that way. So, so you're giving us a third act shift in perspective. Yeah, which basically, is what's happening here. Yes. Which I, I'm all for. It's a good storytelling narrative, like Thank it's a you. good storytelling device. Thank you. So, yeah, uh, f- fucking UFO cases. What's what, what's going on? So, Ed would later give a more detailed description of the creature that visited him at the back porch window to move on investigators. Uh, like I said, he describes it as about four feet tall. So here's where he actually gives like a number. Uh, it says it has dark gray skin and large black eyes uh, resembling the contoured eyes of a grasshopper. Okay. Uh, its body was covered, like I said, in little boxes that hinged at the middle and shoulders, and Ed was speculating that the boxes were some sort of shield, uh, and he says that this was because of its calm demeanor in the presence of Ed's pistol that he assumed that it was not worried about him shooting him or harming him because... It was shielded. I I don't know. It, okay. I, I get what he's saying, but it's like, yeah. <laughs> it's uh, I don't know. I I one of the things that I also find running through this story that I find funny in is in these like close encounters of the third kind stories is how many human traits are are projected onto oh aliens. Like the idea that it's like oh I recognize that fucking Glock. I'm now calm, which are two things: recognition of a gun and calmness which maybe the aliens are just so like it just is funny to me how many human things aliens do in these stories oh the way the way that people anthropomorphize alien beings is continuously very and entertaining to me and one of those things that like it's one of those things that once you notice it and start to like reject it you you just start going like what the fuck is anyone talking because <laughs> i look I'm not saying that there's not simultaneous evolution in ter- in terms of making humanoid forms somewhere else in the galaxy. It's a very big fucking galaxy. It may be infinite depending on what you believe. So sure, any any anything could happen. But like the fact that they would ha- be able to both process and read human emotions exactly and like they would then reflect them at us, like the fact that y- you think that they fully understand what you are doing and also are not like can, that you can understand their reactions by like reading facial cues yeah. is unhinged. The, the, you know, it's just, and to like, when you think about the conditions that like created, you know, humanity and our, our world and culture and, and everything, our languages. And it, when you think of that, it's um it's it's just 
it's it's funny to me that we could think that like there's all these unbelievable contingencies that require that are required to reach this very specific thing that we are. Uh, mm-hmm. Why we would expect it to develop the same way if there's alien life, I don't know. Um, Look, uh, the thing we know about the the cosmos is that across all civilizations, if you grab that little patch of skin on someone's elbow that bunches up and say the word <laughs> weenus, they will laugh. Yeah. That is a universal concept. That's universal. That is the one simultaneous evolutionary trait of every single being across the cosmos. So if, so a, if a reptilian, if a reptilian's bearing down on you, yeah. they're like, "I'm here to do reptilian fucked up reptilian shit to you. Come with me onto my yeah. ship. Just Fucking pitch that no. thing." Yeah, and and at least disarm them. It's it's like a it's like a Bugs Bunny tactic where he kisses Elmer Fudd, you know, yeah, yeah, like dress yeah. up as Lady and kiss Elmer Fudd just to confuse him. Uh, it, it's the same principle, shock yeah. and awe. Yeah, and another trick that actually really works super well in the reptilians is when they pull out their double barreled shotgun. If you put mm-hmm. your two fingers in it, yeah, and they pull the trigger, it'll it'll sort of blow up and curl back and blow up in their own face, and that's a good tactic against the. Uh, the reptilians <laughs> that's very good yeah uh it, it also works well on the mon stars so yeah uh <laughs> what, what, what how many we have what two more of these he has two more sightings two more oh no he has a lot more i, I have so I, many where did more. i get the number head oh <laughs> shit okay somewhere in my brain i got the i got the idea that this man saw six six different sightings and i don't know where that came well, from we, that's probably something like, i made up it was like three or four in the first episode but all i can tell you <laughs> The re- the entire, I'll just say it, this entire episode is just going to be sightings that he had. Okay, um, cool. Because it continues. Fantastic. So, so it's probably more than six, and I have no idea where I got that number. No, it's okay. It's It'll be more than six, but I never, all I said was that in the last episode, he had seen three or four UFOs. Okay. Um, Or he'd, he'd had three or four sightings of what he assumes is the same UFO. Uh. So yeah, this thing is not scared of his his gun because it's wearing armor. It has this silver rod with an, an energy glow to it, mm-hmm. um, and so yeah, he he would later kind of give those details to move on, but that's much later. Uh, okay. So December third, it's the next day after the encounter with the unknown being, and Ed. Oh, Walters, so the other one was on my birthday. Oh yeah, that's yeah. yeah, that's right. The last on the last yeah. episode, yeah. Um, yeah. So, uh, ooh, interesting. Maybe something weird was going on December. Because, like, that's not the year you were born. No. But maybe they were, like, ramping up. They were, like... Yeah, I think, like, look... Project Nile is underway at this point. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, sure. We'll go with that. (laughs) I was not not going to come up with anything better, so I'm just going to go with that. So I, I thought I I thought I was gonna go for some something and my brain just went blank, and sometimes it happens, you know. <laughs> yeah. It's so funny though. It's like <laughs> whenever you read a like, it's like oh your birthday, but like years before you're actually born, you still yeah. like look at that date and you go oh shit I'm in this. Yeah. There, there, <laughs> The, yeah, it's like I'm reading. I'm reading about like the 1800s, and I see December the second. I'm like, fuck oh, hell yeah, yeah, that's me. <laughs> I, I I was not in 18th century Germany. What the fuck? It could have been yeah. cool though. You don't know. Yeah. Hey. Hey. Um, look. Time travel. Let's let's send me back there. <laughs> so December third, 1987, yeah. the next day after the encounter encounter with the unknown being, Ed Walters checks the newspaper and finds more reports of UFOs and. The first one includes a photo submission, which was claimed to have been taken a year previously, uh, and it's of it's a photo of an object that re- I guess resembles the same thing that Walters had been seeing, and it's accompanied with this uh, this message, this letter to the editor, and it says, "Dear editor, I am very relieved to see the UFO photos. They look just like the photos enclosed I took last June '86. I never showed mine to anybody for fear of ridicule." They were taken with a 35 millimeter after dusk, facing west in Shoreline Park South. It came from behind the north trees very fast and then stopped perfectly still. It stayed there for five or six seconds before flashing off to the north and out of my sight. It happened so fast that I doubted what I had seen. The film came back when the developer with no prints. The film came back from the developer with no prints of the object, but then I checked the negatives and there it was. The developer had not printed them, thinking they were too dark. Like the other person, I too don't need the headaches that this can bring, so I withhold my name. 
So <laughs> that's another theme with this where like photos begin to pour in uh, after the initial sighting uh, for mm-hmm. weeks, uh, they would they would keep coming in. So there's another anonymous local uh, that had submitted a sighting that they say occurred on November 11th, 1987, which would have been a day after Walters' first sighting. And so, this is for sure a different guy, not just Walters under another pseudonym? Um, I don't think there's any way for us to know. Okay. Uh, I mean, Walters is, say- again, from his account, from Walters' account, these are sightings that are in the newspaper that he's like, he's cracking that thing open going, oh shit, there's more sightings in the area uh, that are effectively corroborating what he saw. Okay. Um, but, you know, it's it's still just like, you know, this these people, uh, they, they could just be like, you know, oh, well, I'm going to follow up this Mr. X guy uh, and, and, and submit my own thing. Um, but I guess Walters could be sending in, but none of these are coming in under the Mr. X name. Uh, right. But so, so who knows? I, you know, I, I'm going to, honestly, I kind of doubt that it's him, but, um, cause like, I don't know how, I don't know how he would get the message out there without leaving some sort of paper trail. Um, yeah. cause like uh, he's delivering on behalf of Mr. X, right? Um, right. Whereas like these other people had to have mailed something in, uh, and I guess just not re- no return address. I, I don't know. I guess that's, just yeah, what it would have, uh, it would have been, uh, he would have had to go to lengths to make this work to be other. But yeah. So, okay. Yeah. I was just curious. Cause like he's already under one pseudonym. I didn't know if this was like one of those things where a guy just fucking I leads, no a, leads a one man psyop. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's hard to say, but I, I kind of doubt it. Um, okay. So it says, Dear UFO Cider, my husband and I feel you are not alone. However, I'm not sure if we saw the same thing. It was about 5.30 to 6 that evening. We were in our car. The object was overhead. At first, we thought it might be a plane or helicopter. However, when we rolled down the window of the car, we heard no noise. Did you hear a noise from it? Was it between 5.30 and 6 Wednesday evening? I remember my husband saying when when we saw it, that's not a plane. No plane can stay still like that. And it did just bob up and down. He said it wasn't a helicopter, for it made no noise. He rolled down the car window and stuck out his head. I said, get your head in, for if it is a UFO, it may zap us up. <laughs> I kind of doubt okay. that's the exact phrasing this person used. That just sounds very, um, <laughs> I don't know. Get your well, head in, they, for, well, if it is a, for if it is a UFO, it may zap us up. They just came out of, like, a weird double feature of 50s sci-fi yeah, movies yeah. and also, like, Ben-Hur. So they have, like, <laughs> yeah. a really weird mix of of influences going into that, yeah. you know? Yeah, Uh It finishes by saying, We laughed and said if we told anyone, they would take us away in white jackets. We thought it may be from the Air Force also, but we doubted it. Please let us know if yours made noise. Um, I remember reading uh, somewhere... And this is actually a thing that I've been meaning to cover for a long time. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it's it's on the back burner among many, many other topics. But there is a sort of, uh, th- there's some information out there that suggests that we have, in fact, worked on creating silent helicopters. Uh, yeah. I, 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 I just remember reading this a while ago, but that's like, I do believe this is all associated with the black helicopter phenomena. Um, so th- there is some stuff out there and I'll have to really research it to, and get back to everybody, but there is some stuff out there to suggest that we have been uh, researching uh, noiseless uh, helicopters or, 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 or at the very least helicopters that make way less noise. Um, yeah. And I think it also wrapped up in the um, VS Boas case where like, there's that random story about how maybe the CIA flew to what South America and like Brazil, right? Was it Brazil? Brazil. And, and like, Brazil, yeah. And like staged a UFO abduction using black helicopters and like maybe drugs, um, that, which would be, which like the drugs would, would make it make sense a little bit. But like the funny thing about that one is that's one of the ones where he supposedly fucked some aliens. Yeah. And so the fact that that might've been a CIA black helicopter thing is like, well, is kind of a weird 
fucking juxtaposition. It is weird, but if I remember correctly, he fucks like a, a human looking woman. Um, yeah, <laughs> it, but isn't it like, isn't it like a humanoid alien type thing? I don't remember. I, I think I did this a long time more ago. More human like than alien like. And I, I, I think there's like a gas that he's subjected to in people in like, um, basic, I don't think they use this term, but something akin to hazmat suits. Um, yeah. which is part of what makes that whole story so fucking weird. But, uh, he, and he interprets it as, as aliens, I think, but it, it's, I, I'll have to double check on that one. Um, cause that's another one that I'd like to really revisit in some capacity because of, I, I actually reached out to somebody on Twitter who researches, this stuff when I was like, Hey, do you have more information on that specific case? Because I only saw it in Mirage men. Uh, Mm -hmm. and it was like a couple, it was like maybe two, three paragraphs, if I remember correctly of information. And they were like, here, I have this other little thing that had got some extra little tidbits of info. So I I might be able to, to, uh, jump back on that one again. Cause it's a weird, it's a weird little side story. So maybe, maybe I'll find a, a way to do like a, CIA, con- like a conspiracy about CIA psyop, like drug UFO abductions. I don't know. We'll, we'll see. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, so here after this, this uh, story in the newspaper, there's an odd anecdote by Frances Walters uh, where she claims to have been visited by strange unknown men while Ed was at work. Um. <sighs> At no point okay. does her side of the story make it seem like these are, like, men in black or anything. She, like, she doesn't say, like, you know, oh, they were fucking freaky-ass, like, humanoid, but not totally human. Like, they just, she thinks, like, maybe they're reporters or something, but she's not sure who they are. Um, but the entire, the reason I'm bringing it up is, like, at this point, I think they're both paranoid. Because um, she, like, hides from them. Uh, she decides okay. not to answer the door when these men show up and like scopes them out by peeking through the blinds. And she tells this whole like side story of how like she had just gotten out of the shower and she's in her, her, her uh, towel. And she's like trying to like r- run like sort of stealthily around the area of the house to get to an angle where she can like peek out the blinds at these guys. Um, mm-hmm. And she's home alone. And it's so it's just, it, she seems to be getting a little paranoid here. Um, the only detail we really get about these guys is that they're sort of like gesticulating, uh, like one of them is like waving their arm and another's carrying a copy of the Sentinel and they seem to be holding it up, uh, towards the like lawn, uh, towards their like front yard. And, and it, it seemed like they were comparing photos in the article to the location where they were seemingly shot at. Um, and then, these men leave without Francis or Ed ever speaking to him, but then Ed shows up a few minutes after they leave. Um, and, and what I find a little weird about this is that, uh, I think the part of the suggestion here is like, I don't think that Ed as Mr. X has specifically like said where these photos were taken yet. Um, okay. So there's like this, 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 anecdote about these men showing up and trying to like compare photos from the met from the newspaper suggests that uh they're somehow privy to information that may not i i could be wrong like maybe at some po- i i don't know but i really don't think that he gave out like the specific location yet so it's it's a it's pretty strange um so it's also at this point that you can say that the ufo flap has like gone into full force uh Ed describes every news and radio station discussing the story with news networks, bringing in various experts. And I say that in some scare quotes because these experts are doing that thing that you do on these, these, you know, programs where they like, are like, Oh, I I confirm the veracity of these photos. I'm a scientist and uh, these have to be real because there's no way they can be faked. Um, And that's, what's like running on the news. Uh, It just serves to kind of hype up the story. And of course, the papers were already flooded with sightings and everybody just seems to be in on the uh, excitement from the UFO craze in Gulf Breeze that was yeah, started like, by Mr. X. It's easy to get swept up in in the, the exciting events of a bunch of weird shit happening in your town and, you know, you get a little crazy. It's yeah, good. Yeah. It's a good, fun time. Sometimes it's fun to just, you know, let your hair down and go crazy a little bit and call, you know, mm-hmm. c- 
turn your UFO story into a newspaper under a pseudonym, you know, and get mind melded with blue UFO beams. Just go crazy for a minute, you know? Um, yeah. It's fun. It's, it's a nice, loose. it's a nice, uh, it's a nice change of pace from the normal humdrum of your everyday life. You know? Speaking of going crazy, Niall, I don't know what's come mm-hmm. over me. Ever since I got back from Phoenix, I've been listening to like thrash metal and hardcore. Okay. What, what have you been listening to? Uh, a lot. A lot of municipal waste. Uh, okay, yeah, yeah. Power trip. Yep. Um, power trip fucking rules. I I was listening to uh, Anthrax today. <laughs> okay. Have Have you been uh, listening to Mind Force? Oh, Mind Force. No, but I I I'm aware of Mind Force. And now that you're the, saying it, the, I'll, the I'll, I'll listen to the crossover. Again. Yeah, the perfect crossover between thrash metal and hardcore. I, I'll have that's to listen. Fucking... That that's next on my list then because I don't also, know what came uh, over me. Uh, add add drain to that drain list. yes i'm familiar with drain <laughs> so yeah the new angel dust album fucking hell too, yeah if, you, if, if you're into that even though that's not quite that's like they they continue to go lighter but um i i just fantastic. want you to picture out there uh mm-hmm. just like you know just fast as fuck thrash and hardcore blaring in yeah. my headphones as i'm typing about aliens and ufos that's that's what oh. i want people to, to think yeah. about that's that's how I used to write papers in college. Was just like, <laughs> like listening to like Gojira and like Watain and like oh, listening yeah, to like yeah. black metal, uh, and and uh, li- just like staying up until fucking four a.m. finishing papers on music history. Absolutely, yeah. So that's what Fantastic. I've been up to. Um, Hell yeah! <laughs> L- got long live the metal. Oh Love yeah. It. Um. So Dwayne Cook, the editor from the Sentinel, and Don Ware, the representative that had been sent by Mufon. To investigate this case, uh, they both appear on a local nighttime call-in television show, uh, once again imploring the mysterious Mr. X to please come forward and explain themselves. And eventually Walters decides to continue operating with the claim that he's merely the messenger for this Mr. X person. And on December 4th, 1987, Walters gets in contact with the aforementioned MUFON representative, uh, Don Ware, and another named Charles Flanagan. Uh... So on that day, on the, on the 4th, they show up in the afternoon at the Walters household, and they're there to just, you know, take photos, get measurements. They're, like, measuring the distances between, like, things in the lawn to kind of, like, you know, maybe extrapolate the size of this object based on photos and things. Mm-hmm. Um, A thing that we, we have not, uh, that we've talked about extensively on the show about how that never works and... <laughs> It's is, not, uh, it's not, not very accurate, super reliable. Yeah. yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah, so he, he, he'd had them come out there and let them do this and they get the story basically in person from Ed and Ed is still operating as, you know, Oh, you know, I'm doing this on behalf of Mr. X. Um, he kind of notes here, like, I don't know if they know, if they have a suspicion that I'm Mr. X, but I'm starting to think maybe they do, I'm not sure. But if they do, they don't show it. Um, and then after getting what they wanted, this this team from MUFON, uh, they drop off some papers from saying like, you know, we need Mr. X to sign these. And then they go about their day. They leave. Um, and Ed just, What do you think Mr. X's signature looks like? It's probably... Um, you know, like a serial killer's signature, you know, is what I'm imagining. Again, I still can't get the, the, the Resident Evil 2 monster out of my mind. So I'm picturing him like, you know, holding a pencil in a fist and, you know, yeah. just carving his name into that hard as fuck. And as soon as he finishes the second line in the X, the pencil tip snaps off. That's what I'm yeah, picturing. I think that works pretty well. Like, there, there's a it's it's weird that I do think of that, but there's also a like comic book character that I think is like an independent creator called Mr. X. I, I forget who it is who writes that, but it's all of the um the like opening splash pages with the t- titles on them are like uh old um the spirit ones where like the the city is like turned into the letters and they're, like, oh yeah they're, like high yeah. contrast fucking noiry looking shit. It's really cool. Um, I, I never fully read the comic though, but I looked through it a lot back in the library. Um, so that's what comes so maybe, to mind for me. Yeah. Maybe that's I, what they're drawing for the signature and they have to wait there for yeah. like 15, 20 minutes as they sketch out <laughs> this giant, giant piece of art on the signature line. 
Yeah, yeah, it's like it's like going to a con where someone does a, like a con sketch, you know? Yeah. Where it's like yeah. it, there is detail to it, but it's not like a full cover, you know? Uh, yeah. yeah, absolutely. Right. Um. So yeah, Mister X is supposed to sign these papers. Um. And Ed, I guess Ed describes how more news reports were coming out about these UFOs, you know, TV and 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 whatever. Uh, they've got astronomers and scientists examining this evidence, these photos. Uh, there was like this news segment where a local reporter seems to sort of it's it's funny the way that this is written. Um, basically, this local reporter on the news is like, I think I can debunk uh, the the UFO. And everybody else at the news station is like, it's almost like they're like rolling their eyes at her. And mm-hmm. they like eventually like drag it like she's like refusing to say what she thinks it is. And they like eventually drag it out of her and they um, and she suggests that it was the the UFO was the uh, Pensacola Beach water tower being misidentified. And, you know, when you show the photo of that and and like compare the photo, it's just the comparison is, of course, not especially convincing. And it just makes me wonder. Was that like the way it's written is very strange. It's like. It's very strange. Like, I wonder if this was how it went down or like, like did this news report go down this way where this like news lady embarrasses herself because she's like, I can beat this hoax or, Mm. or, or was it like, is, is, is maybe Ed Walters sort of retelling it in a way that makes it sound more like his story is believable and the naysayers are, are uh you know embarrassing themselves because the evidence is so good like that that's i can't really tell i can only speculate because i've not seen this this news report but the way he tells it makes it sound like you know oh if you're coming after me as a debunker you're embarrassing yourself yeah that that is uh, i never know what to do with some of those things where just like this this sounds so from someone's perspective yeah (laughs) it serves their their shit i know yeah it it happens uh, so by this point, the UFO clamor in the area is at a fever pitch. Uh, Ed begins to feel kind of worn down over the whole thing. And he takes a moment here in the book to consider whether or not there was a way to make a more quote unquote friendly contact with the UFO. Uh, it's December 5th of that same year. It's 5 30 AM and Walters can't sleep. He's got a lot on his mind. He's tossing and turning, thinking about work and thinking about the UFO. And eventually he feels too restless to stay in bed and he gets up. And here's what he says happens. Easily, I turned onto my left side and laid my right hand gently over Frances's fingers near her cheek. She is the best part of my life, always there when I need her and always there for the kids no matter what her sacrifice. The sight of her lying there in peace seemed to calm my thoughts. Maybe the UFO had done what it came to do. Maybe it was over. I wanted to hold Frances and tell her, her it was over. No, let her sleep, I told myself. Trying not to rouse her, I slipped out of bed, aware that she always seems to know when I was getting up. She turned and wiggled deeper into the covers. I picked up my bathrobe and tiptoed out of the room. I didn't have anything really pressing me. As far as my business was concerned, I just couldn't lie there anymore with my thoughts whirling and my muscles wanting to move. In the kitchen, I started to make some coffee but changed my mind. Frances takes care of the kitchen, and I couldn't find the coffee. I didn't want to bother her by banging pots around, so I just sat at the breakfast bar and looked at yesterday's paper. I glanced up at the clock. It was nearly six. About 500 feet across the soccer practice field behind my house, the sun was breaking the horizon over the high school. The darkness lifted from the east, and the backfield began to show more clearly. I noticed an object hovering above the ground very close to the school. I jerked from the bar stool and pressed my nose to the window. Damn, the UFO was there, below the tree line. It was different, really different. It was bigger. I could hardly move. Not that I was frozen in fear. It was just so incredible to see. I shook my head to clear my thoughts and make my body function. The gun and camera were on my nightstand. As I rushed into the bedroom and grabbed them, Francis stirred and said something. I was already moving back out the bedroom door, running to the kitchen, and couldn't hear what she said. I went out the back door and to the end of the pool. I stood behind the wooden windscreen, leaning back against it for a moment to steady myself. I took a deep breath and held it while I spun around and aimed the camera. I braced myself and pushed the shutter button. The UFO had lifted higher and was hovering, still, above the trees near the school. 
Then the UFO voice came to me. Do not resist. Stay where you are. You are in danger. We will not harm you. Zehas. I turned and ran back to the house thinking, won't harm me, my ass, right. I know all about your blue light and I'm not interested. I know what it can do. I hadn't said anything, but the voice answered, Zehas, we have come for you. And here, Ed makes a note that this this Zehas term, it's more mm-hmm. of a sound than an actual name to him, but he does. that's his best way of describing it. Ah, so like Yahweh. <laughs> yes, it's a lot like Yahweh. Um, <laughs> so, so I, that I don't know why that Im- like it was instant when you said that it was like uh, uh, so yeah. That, no, I, I think I think you're right. It's it's very Yahweh esque. Uh, yeah, because that's that's supposedly what the sound of breath is. Is it that it's like you're breathing like in that. and I don't something re- and then out? I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Anyway, um, so he goes on and says. The UFO hovered slowly across the field, once again very low to the ground. By now, I figured that everybody on my street would have seen the UFO. Surely somebody had called the police. The voice said, no. No? No what? Nobody had seen them? Nobody had Don't called the call police? Don't call the cops. Don't call the cops. Yeah. No cops. Uh, no cops. I got, I got a record. <laughs> got priors. <laughs> No, don't run away. I watched them from yeah. under the big porch roof. No way was I going to budge. I should have taken more photos, but I was afraid to cover my eyes with the camera, afraid to take my eyes off it as it moved closer. Finally, I pointed the pistol at the UFO. I yelled, I'll shoot. My voice didn't come out right. Again, I'll shoot. The words echoed as if they were in a pipe. The voice, no, step forward. Screw you, come and get me. Flash, they were gone again. Again, straight up. I went back into the house, quietly closing the door behind me, questions racing through my head. What the hell did they want from me? Why all these cryptic messages? When would this all be over? The UFO voice actually seemed to be calling me by name. Not my name, but Zehas, whatever that was. The voice was clear when it was said, Zehas, we have come for you. What the hell was going on? The insinuation was that the UFO occupants had named me, maybe like a pet, but that was outrageous and more than I could accept. My mind whirled with confusion and I felt sick to my stomach. This had to stop, or if not, I had to get help. Okay. That is a weird <sighs> it's one. Pretty like weird. anytime anytime you get an alien supposedly actually communicating directly with a human. Because like so many sightings, you you know, they might hear some stray words in the UFO during the abduction, or even like if there are multiple aliens, them communicating with each other. But I always like the cases where the human actually talks to the alien in some form or fashion, communicates with them more than talks. I yeah, guess would be a better way to say it. it, it, it yeah, and there's been so many bizarre details in his stories because, uh, mm-hmm. like, the one that I can't get over is the one where it's like he hears Spanish and then some discussion about like bananas. It's like mm-hmm. what the. <laughs> Oh, see, I actually have kind of an answer. For oh, okay. That what, what do you think that was? So this is the thing that used to happen to me in my in my old house uh, in Fountain Square. Mm-hmm. So I used I used to record some bands in that house, and yeah. that house was old and had bad power. And ghosts. The power was not clean. Yeah. Well, maybe. Um. Basically, it it needed grounding. It wasn't fully grounded. So. Anytime I would plug in uh, a direct box and like run it parallel so I could get a direct signal and also go into a guitar cab, I would turn, uh, if I didn't have the ground lift on on the DI box, it would pick up a Spanish language radio station (laughs) that was in the airwaves going through the area. And I would start hearing like whatever was on the Spanish language uh, uh, um, uh, like radio station. And I would have to go and remember, oh, shit, I got to go flip the switch to turn the ground on. So basically, this is a thing that I've found in multiple like paranormal. Well, I've been doing research on like different paranormal encounters where they will hear something like that. And it's like, oh, no, they just have unclean power in whatever building they're in. Hmm. (laughs) The power is not well grounded. So you're getting a leak of unshielded wiring picking up radio signals. Oh, I I, okay, Interesting. Now. Nile, I, I, I hate to burst your bubble, but you need to remember yeah. that this is all happening inside Ed's mind. So checkmate, really. Oh right. Um. So I don't know. Kind of. Yeah. Kind of. 
kind of wasted a couple Look, minutes on that. He, maybe he <laughs> maybe he didn't wear his tinfoil hat yeah. and he picked up a fucking that's radio uh, station. Maybe, okay? I don't know. I mean, that's, you know, I guess that's possible. But again, I think that that's really, I don't know. I feel like you're tilting at windmills with this one, but... Um, <laughs> But uh, yeah, I kind of forgot that it was in his head and I was trying to justify it to myself after the fact. But yeah, I forgot about that. fact. Uh, so anyway, it's an interesting. No, fucking I, it, thing, is, okay? it is interesting. I'm just joking. Um, it is interesting. I could definitely see that being a good explanation for 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 some stuff. I, I've straight up seen it in people with yeah, ghost, ghost yeah. encounters. Oh, really? I've seen it in oh, stories. Wow. Yeah. That's amazing, yeah. actually. Um. So we fast forward to December 10th. It's been four weeks of UFO hustle and bustle about Gulf Breeze. And Ed is deeply disturbed by these experiences lately. Uh, he theorizes this. He theorizes that during that first sighting back in November, when the UFO had failed to abduct him, it had nonetheless, accidentally or not, established a connection with him. And this was Walter's best guess as to why he could communicate with the beings in the craft psychically and why they seemed to be coming to him specifically. Um, which I find interesting because it's an in lore reason for him to be the star of the show, you know? Yeah. Um, so that's, that's, that's interesting. Ed caught that that was like a problem with a lot of these, uh, UFO stories is the, the exceptional, uh, individual that, that seems to always get contacted by these things. So, um, yeah, and by this point, Ed had given in and accepted that he couldn't, like, he's basically like, I can't escape this phenomenon. I don't have any idea how to get rid of it, so I'm going to just continue to check the papers and hope it goes away. Yeah. So okay. more sightings would uh, pour in from residents in Gulf Breeze uh, through the Sentinel. Uh, here's another one that popped up the next day. Uh, it says, uh, well, okay, sorry. So the first thing that he sees in the newspaper that day is a statement that MUFON releases to the press, which says, quote, preliminary evaluation prior to the photogrammet photogrammetric analysis is an unknown of great significance because of the quality of the five photographs and the reputation of the independent witnesses. Uh, so there, basically, this art, there's like an article accompanying that that says that you know, the pictures have been closely examined and they so far seem authentic and have not been able to be disproven. Um, and, and that's, that seems to be the story that they're running with at this time. Uh, and they now have another report that comes in, uh, from somebody going by the name Jane. Uh, and this is from Citronelle, Alabama. Which is odd. I, so, like, he says that these sightings so far had come in from Santa Rosa and Escambia County, this the area that it, this stuff had, had been coming in. Um, mm -hmm. uh, but now uh, they have these two from Alabama coming to the Sentinel with their story. And here's what it says. This couple owns about 20 acres of mostly deer land with two ponds on the property. On the night of November 19th, Jane's husband was outside when he suddenly saw an object idling in the sky over one of the ponds with a beam of light shooting to the ground. He ran inside to get Jane, and when they returned, the object had moved over to dry land, then returned over the pond. Then her husband shined a flashlight toward the object, and it disappeared. Uh, now, Citronelle is about 85 miles northwest of Gulf Breeze. Uh, and so I, I guess it's pot. I mean, given these things and how fast they move, they are supposedly move, I guess it's, mm -hmm. it's possible. Um, and then the Sentinel article continues and says back in Florida last Wednesday, about 6 45 PM, Darlene and a friend were driving North across the Bay bridge. They looked over to the right by the Cordova mall area and saw a whole ball of light pop up from behind the trees. It was round, but we couldn't see any windows or anything, said Darlene. We weren't close enough. At first, they laughed, thinking, there's the UFO. But as the object remained motionless, the scene began to take a different tone. Then the light popped down again, then shot back up, remaining idle until the two had crossed the bridge. So, more sightings um, from different areas in Florida, and then, of course, one in Alabama, just, just outside of Florida. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, I mean... I'll be honest with you, that second one there honestly kind of sounds like ball lightning to me. I know that's like kind of a uh, a joke, a joke, but, yeah. but 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 it does it does sound like 
it sounds like the behavior of ball lightning, maybe. Um, but what do I know? Yeah, here, here's the thing. Even though ball lightning has been used for things that are obviously not ball lightning as a justification for unidentified flying objects, whatever, it doesn't mean that no UFO sighting could ever be ball lightning. Yeah. So I, you know, I think I think this you can you can chalk that one. Yeah. So we fast forward once again, and both Ed and Francis have been lulled into a false sense of security. It's December 17th now, and they hadn't seen the hide nor tail of any UFOs or alien creatures near their property since that previous encounter. They had both become convinced that perhaps their UFO torment had come to an end, but unfortunately, this was not the case. Uh, After going to bed, uh, Ed would once again be visited by the UFO. So December 17th, two hours after falling asleep, Ed is awoken by a bright white flash that he claims only took place inside his own mind, that the white flash, like, flared inside his mind. Uh, Okay. He also makes an ominous note here about how certain things that he couldn't remember from these experiences would later be pulled from his repressed memory when he would eventually undergo hypnotic regression, but that's a story for episode part three. Uh, So he says here, I shuddered and managed to open my eyes. Standing at the side of my bed were three dark figures, exposed only by the traces of light from a streetlight filtering through the nearby window. My vision was very blurred, and I strained to see the figures. They were motionless and looked into my face. Several other shadows moved toward the foot of my bed. I tried to yell, hey, what's going on here? But my voice did not respond to my moving lips. As I opened and closed my mouth, trying to yell, I started to sit up. The figures turned quickly, but deliberately, to leave the room. Struggling to sit up, I thought of trying to grab one of the figures. Suddenly, the noise, which I had remembered and reported earlier, exploded in my head. A strange dizziness swept over me, and I fell forward face down onto the foot of the bed. I tried to shake it off, but couldn't seem to get my balance. For a moment, I lay there and listened. The sound was in my head, but so loud that it seemed I could hear it with my ears. It was just as as if I were standing at the base of a thunderous waterfall. I felt Francis pulling on my left arm as I tried to get up. She was saying something, but all I could hear was the roar of crashing water. Her grasp was determined and her face seemed distorted as I fell off the side of the bed. While I struggled to stand, the noise began to fade. I could hear Francis faintly saying, what is it, Ed? What's wrong? Her voice was hollow and kind of echoed through my head. I could still hear the waterfall, but I could also hear some odd sound that had the same tone as the UFO voice. It sounded like the high and low tones of music being fast forwarded on a reel-to-reel tape recorder. I stood at the foot of the bed with Francis next to me. Breathe deeply, I told myself. I straightened my back and raised my head. I was getting really pissed. Grabbing the camera, I started out the bedroom door, telling Francis to stay there. She didn't listen. I strode into the kitchen. Framed in the kitchen door window, I saw the UFO hovering about 150 feet away. It was much too close, and I was afraid to show myself through the glass. By now, Francis knew I was going out to get a picture, no matter what she said, but I saw no reason to be stupid but stupid about it. There was a way out so that it couldn't see me, through the laundry room door on the side of the house. Creeping out that door, I was able to slip under the back porch. From there, I crawled over to some pompous grass. I was in my underwear, but don't remember feeling cold, even though it was maybe 40 degrees outside. The UFO was to the north, just within the edge of my view. It began to rise and fall smoothly, and to glow and fade. It would rise about 10 feet and glow bright orange, then descend again and fade to a pale orange that was hard to see. From my left, it directly it drifted directly in front of me and hovered there, very still and picture perfect. I shot a photo. The flash went off, but this time I knew it would. I did flinch down, but the UFO made no noticeable change. For a few moments, I lay on the ground with the pine straw poking my bare skin. Then, back on my knees, I pulled the film and slipped it under the elastic waistband on my boxer shorts. Behind me, the French door leading out the rec room opened slightly, and Francis called to me. I answered something, but was absorbed in watching the UFO move away. It stayed about 30 feet high. Suddenly, a bunch of smoke or steam with some kind of liquid came out of the bottom of the power source. Later that day, I retrieved a plastic butter tub the kids had left out. It was full of bubbling liquid. I saved it for future analysis. By now, only a minute or so had passed. I ran up the terrace to the pool deck and hid behind a windscreen. The UFO was moving farther east, away from me, and closer to the edge of a wooded area. About 400 feet from me, the UFO still throbbed on and off with the orange glow. Was the UFO having trouble? Was it going to land? Great, great, great. The glow disappeared at the tree line, and I jumped up from my knees. Had it landed? Maybe it would be there in the morning. 
I strained to see through the darkness. The school's security lights backlit the trees, and I could see nothing on the field. Quickly, I thought, I should call the police. I started back to the house while looking over my shoulder at where it had disappeared. It was there. I knew it. More than anything, I wanted the UFO to be sitting, helpless, in the field. That would wipe out any doubts, answer the questions I couldn't, and eliminate the chance I'd be called a nut. It was too dark to see, but I knew it was there, wasn't it? Before I called anybody, I had to be sure. I started to run out onto the backfield, but stopped when I realized it could all be a trick to get me out into the open. That thought set my heart to pounding. I retreated to safety behind the wooden windscreens at the end of the pool. From there, I watched the darkness for about a minute, not moving. It had to be there. I'd make the call. Again, I started for the back door. The glow reappeared. I ran back to the windscreen and raised the camera. Not yet looking through the viewfinder, I stared at the UFO. I couldn't believe what I saw. This was not the same UFO. Its shape was different. Oh. It looked bigger. It glowed white and was lifting off the ground. Again, it stopped very still, and I could see the grass field glow beneath the power source. I snapped photo 14. No flash. The cube was used up. As before, I pulled the film and slipped it under the elastic on my shorts. I did a lot of running around from one windscreen to another and up and down stairs. Finally, I ran on over to the kitchen door. When I got there, the door popped open. Francis stepped outside. I whispered, what are you doing? She whispered back, what are you doing? Francis continued whispering, and the UFO was moving slowly toward the house again. I didn't really care about the flash cubes, but I wanted her inside, so I asked if she'd get them for me. She went in, and I took off for the back right side of the yard. I stopped at the fence under some small oaks. The UFO was headed in my direction. As I watched through the chain-link fence on my knees as close to the tree as tree cover as possible, I felt something bump my shoulder. I think I yelled and fell into the fence saying, holy shit, what are you doing here? How Francis had managed to get back to me so fast, I'll never know. She pushed a flash cube in my hand and said, take the picture, fast. The two previous photographs had slipped from under my elastic waistband and threatened to drop out the leg of my shorts if I should stand. I quickly pulled them out and stuck them into Francis's hand. The UFO came at us faster than you could follow it. One moment it was 400 feet away, the next it was overhead. How could they move like that? I shot, photo, I shot a photo as it stopped and was still in an agitated state. The UFO photo is blurred, but the tree in the foreground is clear. Okay, so we got a bit of an action shot going. Yeah, yeah. And there's a very weird thing here where I, I don't know if it's an intentional twist yet because I haven't gotten us to the part about, uh, let, let me just say this. Ed describes Francis suddenly being gone and then reappearing very quickly. Yeah. And then in Francis's account, uh, she also kind of describes Ed to have like disappear, disappeared and then miraculously reappearing when she goes to fetch the flash cubes. Um, Interesting. So they both kind of, is it like an unexplained time loss thing or is it like a transport thing or is it it's a good question? Um, and like I said, there is stuff that will come out in hypnotic regression. Uh, okay. As, as is so often with these things, but the, the, the interaction with the UFO actually, uh, continues. Uh, damn. Okay. So he managed to manages to take some photos. Um, and he actually is only able to figure out the the actual like timeline of events that happened here by getting them from the hypnotic regression he would have later. That's what he says here, at least. Okay. So he pulls out another photo and he gives it to Francis and he yells, let's go, let's go run. And he runs across the, the 30 feet to the terrace steps uh, leading to the pool. Uh. And he assumes that Francis is behind him as he's shooting another photograph and he runs up the steps, pulls it out of the camera and puts it in his waistband again. And uh, he notes here that he never finds whatever this photo was and he has no memory of taking it. And at this point, the UFO is like slowly gliding over the roof of their house and he shoots another photo of it. He like stops, he looks up at it, takes a picture and this is when he realizes that Francis is not behind him. Uh, and as he yells for her, he suddenly hears a voice that commands him in his head that says, we are here for you. And he continues yelling for Francis and taking photos. And he has another one of those white flashes fill up his mind. 
and he gets this falling sensation. His eyes go blurry, and he remembers feeling very cold. And then suddenly, he sort of like snaps back into it, and he goes headfirst into his chain link fence next to where Francis is. And he notes here, even with the hypnotic regression, an unknown amount of time yet to be completely accounted for had passed. Uh, he says to, for over a year, I had no recall of ever being away from Francis. She was still kneeling where I had left her and staring into the sky. So the UFO is bobbing back and forth about 30 feet above the oak trees in their yard. And, uh, he hadn't been keeping count of the photos that he was taking, but he also notices that there's no pull tab sticking out of the camera, which means that there is film ready to shoot. And the film pack was empty. Uh, huh? So, uh, Francis still has three of the photos that he had handed to her. Um, and, uh, but apparently there's a bunch of missing stuff here. Uh, and, and again, maybe not accounted for even after uh, hypnotic regression. And they watch as the bottom of the UFO pulsates with energy. There's no sound. And the air, he describes the air feeling heavy and his, his arm hairs standing on end. Uh, he takes another photo and then, uh, Francis yells at something, yells something, although he doesn't know quite what she says. And she, then she says to him, did you get it? Let's go run, run. So they, he grabs her and they run back to the house uh, and reach the back porch as this UFO glides over their house uh, about walking speed. Uh, Francis trips, falls onto the deck near the porch door, uh, and he steps, like Ed steps out from under the porch uh, and snaps another photo uh, as the UFO's bottom ring brightens and it flashes and is just gone. It just disappears before yeah. the photo can go off. I, I feel like I'm watching a movie and counting the bullets right now, you know, <laughs> like try how, how many photos this guy have. I don't know how many photos are in like a roll of polar, like what, whatever he's using for these, these shots. I have no idea how many of them there should be, but uh, we're, we're dealing with some like, uh, you know, lazy writing, not counting the bullet situation <laughs> going on here or yeah. missing time where he's reloading. Or missing camera. time. I don't know. Um, well, he speculates here that because Francis was there holding on to him, uh, like, did that stop the UFO? Because they realized that that blue beam could have hit them at any point. Oh, yeah. Uh, and he wonders to himself, you know, was Francis's presence preventing them from beaming me up to the ship? Uh, or could it have taken both of us if I wanted to? What did they, what was, what had happened here? Yeah. Um, so eventually they make it back into the house safely and examine the photos Ed had just taken. And they also debate, you know, what it all meant. Um, and they especially want to discuss the phrase, we are here for you. And this is where Ed notes that there's no real inflection in the voices of these beings when they're speaking to him in his mind. And so it makes it impossible for him to infer intention or emotion. So is he, he's like, um, are they saying we are here for you or we are here for you? Uh, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, you this, haven't this seen it, question. but for you succession fans, we're in a, we hear for you situation here. <laughs> sure. Sure. That's going to go down like gangbusters. Yeah. The succession Look, fans. I'm, I'm making, I'm <laughs> purely making jokes that are not for you, but are for the general populace in this crowd, which is going to be a great thing for like, the dynamic yeah. of the two of us on this podcast, you know, <laughs> look, you know, it's, it's not like I haven't watched success, succession because like, I, I like dislike it or anything. I just, I don't have time to watch the, a lot of TV, unfortunately. Yeah. Although I did watch the witches of Eastwick last night. So, okay. That How was, was that. That was pretty fun. I liked it. Yeah. <laughs> it was very right. strange. I, I watched uh, I've watched a bunch of like I watched John Wick four finally that movie fucking rules. oh John witches of John Wick yeah which is um, wi <laughs> witches of John yeah exactly what you said what you said so, is correct <laughs> thank you thank you for saying so um hey I have so much more to talk to you about with this story I mean uh, just so much more with but with I, this part or is that the end of this part that's we we can cut it off here okay. Um, because that's effectively the end of this particular 
particular uh, experience. Uh, so they have a fucking fucked up crazy ass experience that suggests there is missing time. And this is where we get the first sort of suggestions that eventually there will be hypnotic regression that uncovers some things that Ed did not realize happened at the time. Yeah. So, we're we're going to go back and fill in all those blanks where I had no idea, like where it, f- the, the, so far this story seems like it's written in like dream logic in movies where like things just kind of happen and you don't notice them immediately, but you're like, wait, those things didn't actually connect. And hopefully yeah. in the near future, uh, we're going to connect those dots. Yes, exactly. So that's part two of cool. the Gulf Breeze UFO, uh, which is a fucking crazy story. I, I had no idea what I was in for when I was covering, when I started you know, researching this, but here we are. So look forward to part three. We're going to follow up on the rest of, of uh, Ed Walters experience. And then we're going to get into some, some differing opinions and views of, of Ed Walters case. Let's roast some this other man info. next, yeah. next week. We're going to well, roast him like fucking garlic to make that nice. Sauce. We're going to put him on a spit. You know? Yeah, yeah, and we're gonna rotate him slowly over a fire and brush him with crisp. juices. Yeah, oh yeah, it's gonna be great. Put an apple in his mouth; mm-hmm. it's gonna be fucked up. And you know, that's kind of what this show's about: is like mocking a lot of our subjects. Yeah, we're really we're really here just really to, to them- make you guys look like <laughs> fools. No, in this case, I'm the fool in this episode. That's been firmly established. Kyle's the expert mm-hmm. here. I'm the fool. That's the roles of this podcast. Uh, and so our subjects aren't the fools. I am right now. And soon enough, I'll be the fool once again, although I am a different type of fool unrelated to this podcast. Yeah. Um, so, Niall, are you ready for the big question? Cool. Yeah, I'm ready. All right. This is a quick and snappy one, maybe. A little, little snappy you, snap snap? Yeah, yeah, unless you decide to, I don't know, fucking drag this out or whatever. <laughs> but, um, oh, I'm going to tell. Look, I've, <laughs> I watched... I definitely didn't watch a bunch of episodes of Common Rider Zero One during work mm-hmm. today, and and can't like when you almost went off in a whole thing when you brought up just the concept of grasshoppers. I'm in a weird. I'm in like a, a yeah. pure like uh, fixation Ugh. thing right now. I gotta check out Common Rider. You got me. All just watch Shin Common Rider. Don't don't start with Zero One. That's like a goofy show, but uh, fucking Shin Common Rider. It's on Amazon Prime. I highly recommend it. It's, it's on my, my number one movie of the year. And yes, I have seen those movies you're thinking of right now. <sighs> Uh, it's better than those. <laughs> oh shit! All right, I, I am very excited to check that out. But Niall, we have a big question. Yeah, we can we can save common rider talk for our common rider cast. Uh, Bonus uh, episode. Bonus episode. Um, excluding me, your direct family, Jules and Garrett, who would you trust to back you up and corroborate your story if you witnessed a UFO? God, this is like trying to figure out who to put as references on my like resume. <laughs> um. <laughs> I mean, I, I know who I want. Yeah? Who do who yeah. do you got? Bob Odenkirk. Why? Oh, because Mr. Have Saul seen, himself. Have you seen Saul Goodman do his I thing? Have. have you have you listened to the comedy Bang Bang where Bob Odenkirk is on it and they, they come to the, the point that once you do a hundred episodes as a lawyer on TV, you're actually legally a lawyer? <laughs> I think I think I have seen that, yeah. 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 So legally he's a lawyer, he's a bang up actor. Uh, he's a sweetheart who everybody loves and it, you know, you immediately get enamored to him. So it's like, if he were to come up and be like, this guy, Kyle saw a UFO and you better believe he's telling the truth. Everybody would believe him because it's Bob fucking Odenkirk, yeah. whether it's the association with better call Saul or loving him from, you know, Mr. Show or, or, or maybe you're a huge fan of, um, uh, what was the movie where he's like an old man who beats people up? Uh, uh, Oh no, Mr. Nobody. Uh, maybe you're a or Mr. Nobody, nobody head. whatever it was. Maybe, yeah. maybe you're a nobody freak. That was actually a pretty fun movie. I, I haven't seen it. I don't know. It, it, <laughs> it's not like it, it, that wasn't. I didn't think you were digging at it. I just have okay. seen it. So I figured I would. It's it's worth watching if you're into that kind of thing. Thank you. I am into Bob Odenkirk, which is that kind of thing to me. Yeah. So uh, that's that's who I'm picking. What about uh, you? I'm I'm going to go with a little bit of a different tactic here. Because, mm-hmm. even though, actually, no. I did realize I wasn't thinking about this, but I, I was I, I immediately jumped to uh, the Mr. If the glove fits, you must if the glove fits, you must acquit yourself. Uh, mm-hmm. But I can't I feel like I can't do another lawyer, even though this is a real life person. So 
I think what I want to do is, is just say that, um, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. no, I'm going to, I'm going to get backed up by fucking, um, okay. So my, the person I'm going to have back me up is Mr. Don LaFontaine. Now for the, what? for those, you know, so this is not a name that immediately bring forward something in your head, the, right? The name sounds familiar. Yes. So Don LaFontaine, for those that don't know, uh-huh. is the guy who does voiceovers for a lot of movie trailers. Oh, who has the okay. in a world, yeah. you know, yeah. that voice. And in I a think world that, where Niall sees a UFO. I think that he's just one of the most convincing sounding people like voice wise. Like you can't hear that voice and not be kind of bought in on the premise of whatever he's saying, you know, just because it, it's it's been yeah. so he's so uh, like linked to that kind of stuff in your brain. And he's so authoritative and has such a nice, rich, sultry voice that you're just like, okay, no, I, I think I can, I think I can get down with what this guy's saying. You know, you're making, that's a really good, I like that answer. And you're making me want to switch my answer to the super smash bros announcer. <laughs> See, um, th- this is the thing like that. That is your Johnny Cochran where uh, I almost <laughs> went with a lawyer, even though you did a lawyer and that, but, and it's perfectly reasonable, but like, uh, I think the, the super smash bros, I always think of, what is your video game announcer voice that comes into your oh, brain when you just like think of announcers? It's it's that one. And, yeah. and it's funny too because like the inflection on different names is so wildly different. Like it's, you know, he's very jazzed about certain characters like yeah. Ice Climbers or like but then it's like Ganondorf. Yeah. But he, I'm he's thinking, seriously nonplussed about some of the characters, which is <laughs> yeah. interesting from a choice perspective. Uh, but I'm sort of imagining a, a scenario where you you know you select me on the Smash Bros. character screen, yeah, and it says Kyle saw a UFO. I think that's one. really good. See, thank you. Here's here's the thing for me. Like the when I think of an, an announcer, I immediately snap to NBA Jam. Okay, because oh, wow. I played that that's game so much surprising. as a kid. Uh, it was for some. Re- it was a game that my dad bought back when he was trying to like play video games okay, and okay, I got you. Uh, so it was just like one of the like six Sega Genesis games I had as a kid. Okay. And so it has like this really just, I don't know who it is. I don't know anything about sports announcers other than Harry Carey. Uh, but this is, it, he just from downtown. It's just like in my brain <laughs> forever. And I uh, will never, it never good. goes away. He also sounds a lot like, uh, um, Kevin Kelly on a, on AEW collision, who I think is a bad announcer, but, mm. uh, it sounds like him. So it, it stays in my brain. And I think of that, the NBA jam announcer like every week now, and it's not something I expected to be doing in 2023. Well, I, I love that for everybody involved. And I think there's something magical. There's, there's something to be said about the magical, uh, tones that the dulcet tones of, uh, professional announcers mm-hmm. that has to be an incredible job. Um, yeah. it's like somebody was like, damn, you have the most wicked voice ever. Can you say a bunch of names for me? Yeah. Can you just uh, say like, can you with good diction say a bunch of proper nouns in a row very quickly? That's right. And you know who else I would also not like if we're just going purely by voices, um, and, and not necessarily by like the person as a whole, Mm-hmm. Uh, Brad Garrett could be fun. Yeah, he could be fun. Um, yeah. What other fun voice? Kyle saw there? Kyle saw a UFO, ma. <laughs> <laughs> I was so I'm. I saw the hesitation in your eyes <laughs> of should I or should I not try to do a bad? Do I have a Brad Garrett within me? Can I reach into my soul and come out with Raymond from Everyone Loves Raymond's big uh, well, brother? Well, Raymond's easy. Raymond just has to whine about yeah. how little sex his wife. Dabra, is yeah, Dabra, you're not boning me enough, Dabra. <clears throat> um, Niall, do you want to take care of some business? Yeah, I, I think we're at that stage. So. If you want to follow us on social media, you can follow us on Twitter at IGW Podcast. You can follow us on Facebook.com slash It Gets Weird Podcast. And we're on all your favorite podcatchers from Google Play to Apple Podcasts to Spotify. If you listen to podcasts somewhere, look up It Gets Weird and we're probably there. Oh, we're also on YouTube. I never say that. Oh, yeah, we are. Well, the YouTube thing was people were like, 
asking for access to the show on YouTube. So it does automatically upload to YouTube. I actually don't know how much people are listening through YouTube, but for those of you who really wanted YouTube for whatever reason, uh, it is there. Yeah, we are on YouTube. I I think if you just look up, it gets rid podcast, you'll find us. But I think our actual username on there is like IGW podcast. Maybe I think, um, I should know that. Um, we don't, but, I never uh, look. I don't look at it that much. I, I see like I an occasional bother. email of someone leaving a shitty comment. But <laughs> yeah, same. That's about it. Um, yeah, that is actually where we get the most deranged comments is YouTube. Who'd have thunk? Um, but uh, Twitch.tv slash It Gets Weird, if you also do like our, you know, if you like the idea of video content, uh, I stream on Twitch. Uh, now, I've been out of town for two weeks, so I, I haven't been streaming, but stream will be coming back soon, hopefully in a more uh, scheduled and regular capacity is my plan. So look forward to that and give us a follow. Uh, email us at It Gets Weird Podcast at gmail.com. Uh, send us voice recordings like a vocaroo or whatever of you doing your best Brad Garrett impressions. Something about UFO. Have him say something like, you know, I got sucked or uh, I got sucked up to do UFO, ma, because he's always screaming at his mom in uh, that show. Uh, Everybody loves Raymond. So yeah, email us that Uh, patreon.com slash it gets weird. We have a $2 tier and a $5 tier at the $2 tier. You get access to the main show two days. er Oh shit. I got this all out of order at the $2 tier. You get, a bonus show called It Gets Weird TV, where right now we're wrapping up the X-Files season one. Niall and I are discussing it, having a good time revisiting the X-Files. And then as a donor, you get to vote on what our next weird show is that we're going to cover. Uh, at the $5 tier, you get access to a bonus show that happens in the off weeks of It Gets Weird TV. So you're getting bonus content every single week. Whether you donate to the $2 tier or the $5 tier, you get access to the main show two days early on Friday instead of Sunday. And you get access to the main, sh- uh, oh my God, you get access to the Discord where we're hanging out, chatting about all kinds of UFOs and conspiracies and cryptids. Uh, is that all we offer right now? I think. Uh, you get yeah. access to the main feed episodes a couple days early. Did you yeah, that's, that? that's, that's, I did say okay. that. Oh my God. <laughs> Look, it's been, it's, it's been like two weeks since you did this. We gotta, so yeah. it, it gets pushed out of your brain. Yeah, you gotta, gotta shake the rust off. And we also do have a $1 tier. Uh, that, you know, you don't get anything out of it. You just get the satisfaction of, you know, kicking a tip to your favorite paranormal uh, UFO conspiracy podcast. Uh, and also, if you sign up for the Patreon at the 2 or $5 tiers, just a reminder, if you don't get an invite to the Discord, hit us up, send us a message through Patreon, we'll hook you up, because uh, uh, our, our connectivity between Discord and Patreon is all kinds of fucked up. So just, if you don't get an invite, let us know through Patreon and we'll help you out. Uh, If you can't donate, please tell your friends, tell your enemies, tell your congressmen all about It Gets Weird Podcast. Cool. Well, thank you all for listening and continuing this journey through this multi-parter. We'll be back next week with with the next section of it. Uh, Thank you all for listening. It Gets Weird. I've been Niall. And I'm Kyle signing out. Peace.